Hey, you. I, I should probably explain why this video is over here and not on Mother's Basement, right? Although, if you don't want to hear any of that and you just want to get into the video, you can skip to the next chapter. See, I, I wrote this script in a single five-hour burst of excitement after the new One Piece set photos dropped, but then, after recording it and seeing it edited, I realized it doesn't really fit with anything else that I've posted to the channel lately, except maybe the Jujutsu Kaisen movie review. I want Mother's Basement videos to be something that you guys both look forward to and want to go back to. Uh, something a little bit more timeless than just a reaction to whatever's going on in anime right now. Unless I'm helping you guys discover something new or obscure, and wherever possible even then, I always want to be adding something substantive to whatever media I'm talking about. and. Arguably, this video does do that with the revolutionary hashtag I put in at the end, but not necessarily in a mother's basement-y way. So from now on, whenever I feel inspired to make something more reactive like this, do something unscripted, or drop a god-tier shitpost like the Sonic character design video that the algorithm just won't know what to do with on the main channel, or if Yazzie and I want to do something new and cool together, we're going to put it here alongside the podcast, which for now is going to be a bi-weekly thing. So look forward to that next week. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some really sad news. You probably know the news. We'll get into that. Let's get into this One Piece stuff now, though. Out of all the live-action anime adaptations that have ever been announced, Netflix's One Piece is the one I was most confident would be doomed to failure. I can certainly see the business sense behind it. One Piece is the rare work of art that's both critically acclaimed and widely popular, but a lot of folks who might otherwise get into it are turned off by the cartoony art style or the ridiculous length and never give it a chance as a result. A new live-action retelling has the potential to to fix both those issues and break through to that audience, and there's a ton of money in that. Hell, looking at the reception of the manga, it could even be the start of a global sensation to rival Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones. And if by some chance it does become that kind of crossover fantasy hit, then you've got source material for days, for years, for decades if you want it, although given how actors tend to, you know, age and die, you probably want to pick up that pace a bit, which would also help more with folks who are intimidated by the manga's incredible girth, but all that presumes that the show itself isn't half-assed for a quick buck, and given that only two live-action things based on an anime in all of Hollywood history have ever actually been good, Battle Angel Alita, a solid 7.5 out of 10, and Speed Racer, a gleaming pearl of surrealist brilliance buried deep in the muddy slop of the early 2000s film critic Pigpen, there is next to no precedent set for being anywhere near that optimistic about the series. And that's not even the half of it. While anime in general is notoriously tricky to adapt, One Piece specifically might just be the single most unadaptable work of fiction in the entire history of film. The Lord of the Rings was considered for decades to be utterly unfilmable due to the length of its narrative and the scope of its world, a full continent populated by a multitude of races and cultures with unique architecture unlike anything on Earth and full-blown magic on top of that. Well, The Lord of the Rings is 576,469 words long, and while we don't have an exact word count of One Piece's word bubbles, Reddit's best guesstimates extrapolated from a single chapter, place One Piece chapters 1 to 1,000 between 442,000 and 1.5 million words in total length. So that's between one and three Lord of the Ringses in adaptational difficulty, but we're not done yet. Because you gotta remember, One Piece is a comic book, and that's just the dialogue. There's also pictures, which, as we know, are worth a thousand words each. And with about 18,500 pages in the first thousand chapters of One Piece, multiplied by a rough average of five panels per page, that's about 86,340,000 words, or 149.77 
Lord of the Ringses, in addition to the baseline one to three Lord of the Ringses from the dialogue. And using all those excess words, One Piece is able to build up an entire world, not just a single continent. The nature of those pictures multiplies the challenge further, too, because One Piece isn't just a big epic fantasy that happens to look kind of cartoony. It's an epic fantasy cartoon. The fact that sometimes people's eyes and teeth pop all the way out of their heads when they get real scared is documented human physiology in this setting. You can die of blood loss from a horny nosebleed. The main character sticks his thumb in his mouth mouth like a nozzle so he can blow his muscles up like Popeye, and it actually physically makes him stronger. A dark imposter god is brought low and shown the error of his cruelty and hubris because rubber beats electricity. And, of course, we can't forget about the massive spoilers from the latest chapters, but I won't get into those here. One Piece's world building, its tone, its characterization, are all deeply rooted in Eiichiro Oda's inimitable, carefully crafted art style. Hell, some of the magic is lost just in the process of trying to animate his pictures. To translate that to live action, you would need to make a unique spectacle out of just about every aspect of the production. You'd need richly detailed, authentic costuming, on-point casting for every character, sets and shooting locations that actually make the viewer feel like they're in that world instead of just watching a sitcom set in that world with occasional cutaways to a video game based on it. In other words, for One Piece to be good or work at all in live action, not only does the whole crew need to be passionate for the material, but they have to somehow convince one of the monkeys in suits that runs Hollywood to believe in the project as well. And with as little respect as anime and cartoons get in American big business, the chances of that seemed slim, to put it mildly. But then Netflix revealed the casting for the first five Straw Hats, and it was perfect. Not only did each actor confidently embody the exact energy of their character in the reveal trailer to the point that you didn't even have to look at the name of who they were cast as to instantly recognize, man, that's Luffy, that's fucking Zoro, oh my god, that's Sanji, that's Nami, that is so Usopp. A few were clearly fans and appropriately geeked out about the prospect of bringing Oda Sensei's work to life. And the casting team clearly knew their One Piece shit, too, since they did their best to match the canonical real-world ethnicities that Oda Sensei assigned to each character. Now, it wouldn't have been the end of the world if they didn't manage that, mind you, but the fact that they were accurate to a detail that's only mentioned on one of the between-chapter Q&A pages in the manga suggests that this team might, like, actually give a shit about the world building and story, and the fact that each actor simply is their character suggests the people in charge might actually like and understand the anime they're adapting? That sounds weird to say. I, I don't think I've ever said that about one of these before. Still, live-action Cowboy Bebop had people like that on the crew, and a good cast, not an accurate cast, but a good one, and it still fell substantially short of its potential due to severely uneven production design and CGI that, for all its great little flourishes and McDonald's logos, still looked fundamentally fake. Honestly, I, I think if they just replaced those bits with Star Wars-style miniatures of the Bebop and Swordfish and what have you, the show would have had like five times as many defenders and might even still be around today, but that's just me being fanciful. We live in the future now, and CGI is simply exponentially cheaper and easier to work with than practical effects, sets, and props, especially in such a watery world as that of One Piece. I mean, we all remember when Kevin Costner lost that boatload of money on, uh, you know, the, the one movie Name escapes me at the moment, doesn't matter. Much as One Piece fans would love to see that watery world brought to life like that, it is 
beyond naive to think that the One Piece crew would ever actually get the opportunity to build Going Merry. Smash cut to June 6, 2022, when the One Piece crew revealed that they'd actually built Going Merry. And Barati? And Miss fucking Love Duck somehow? And apparently they're working on Arlong Park right now? And the showrunners specifically emphasized that they're spending a lot of extra effort on the map room, because that's where most of the drama in the arc unfolds, so like, they really really get it. I mean, just take a sec to pause and read this thing that showrunner Matt Owen said to Oda. One Piece is in undeniably great hands. Not all of it's perfect, mind you. Mary's masthead is a little on the creepy side, especially without any details painted on, but that seems like a fairly petty nitpick in the face of the bigger picture here. I mean, it's crazy. No sound stages, no green screens, no fucking Mandalorian holodeck. I mean, sure, maybe they'll use those things at some point in production. They probably will to save money, but they really went and built almost real boats out of real wood and real cloth and real metal and real glass with enough of a surreal edge to the architecture to capture a bit of that all-important cartoony vibe, and they put them all in a studio lot within easy driving distance of the real sand and real surf of South Africa for whenever the Straw Hats have to make land. Against all odds, the Netflix money gods seem to have actually deigned to bless One Piece with the full Game of Thrones treatment. This isn't just a quick money grab, they actually recognize the incredible potential of this property, the powerful commercial appeal that already exists in the unaltered One Piece source material, and they are investing in that, banking on it to give them the must-watch prestige TV cultural touchstone they so desperately need at this moment in their stock trajectory. Now, you might not think that's all too surprising or impressive, given how One Piece is literally the best-selling comic book in all of human history, but if not, you clearly didn't see what these animals did to 12th highest grossing media franchise of all time, Dragon Ball. And if One Piece really is getting the Game of Thrones treatment, well, the biggest problem that show ran into was running out of source material, and that, uh probably won't happen for at least a while here, so that, too, is a very good reason to be hopeful. Of course, there's still the question of if the scripts for the show will be any good, but looking back at earlier interviews with showrunner Matt Owens, it does seem that Oda and his team are more directly involved in this production than we typically see, giving notes on the writing team's scripts and even outlines. Oda has a full executive producer credit here, too, not just an associate producer like Shinichiro Watanabe was on Live Action Bebop, so they probably actually have to listen to that advice. And that doesn't guarantee that the writing will be of any quality, of course, but it does at least show that they're trying to stay true to the spirit of the work and actually take what makes One Piece good and put it on screen, which, again, if you don't think that's special, you have not seen enough of these Hollywood attempts at anime adaptation. At this point, my only major unanswered question is how they'll handle the effects for things like Devil Fruit Powers and the mighty, towering fishmen of Arlong's crew, because obviously there's a lot of ways that could go wrong. From Space Jam to the Fantastic Four movies, we have so many examples of stretchy rubber man characters turning into absolute nightmare fuel the second you point a camera at them. A stronger man. But I'm gonna assume that Netflix wouldn't have tried to make this show in the first place without figuring out how to do that much, so Luffy will probably look fine, and if they can clear that hurdle, the few other devil fruits we see in East Blue shouldn't be much trouble either. Buggy's floating body part trick is something films have been doing since the analog days, and Smoker is literally just a particle effect. As for the Fishmen, well, 
Bad CG tends to look kind of bug-eyed and slimy by default anyway, so even if they completely screw those up, it'll probably at least kind of work. And there's always the possibility that they'll use practical prosthetics and makeup to create most of the characters with sparing CGI used to fill in more difficult details like Arlong's teeth. There's a lot of approaches they could take to making characters like that work. All told, from everything I've seen so far, with how many pitfalls they've sidestepped already, I'm really not that worried about this cast and crew's ability to bring the idyllic anime waters of East Blue to life. But as any One Piece fan can tell you, East Blue is easy mode. The real challenge starts at the entrance to the Grand Line, and that's not just true for the In Fiction crew. The Grand Line is where this world really starts getting weird, where devil fruit powers start popping off left and right, and where more familiar terrestrial animals begin to be replaced by various cuddly, crazy critters from the wilds of Oda's imagination. And those critters are only going to become more and more taxing for the CG team to figure out at the same time as they're having to realize more and weirder devil fruit abilities with every passing arc. In East Blue, the show just has to skip over the island of rare animals, and suddenly there's really just the transponder snails to worry about. Next season, though, the effects squad needs to figure out how to bring yeti bunny rabbits, woolly hippos, banana gators, crab movers, and kung fu dugongs to life without any of them looking the wrong kind of goofy or uncanny. And sure, those are ultimately just background details. Fans will forgive a few mistakes in that area. But then, what of the most important, adorable, and mascotty critter-type member of the entire Straw Hat crew, Karu? Also, Tony Tony Chopper's a bit of a concern. These characters are essential to the soul of One Piece's character dynamics and story. If either one ends up being an uncanny CGI monstrosity, it will seriously threaten the longevity of the entire series, and neither of them is going to be easy to animate or design. They're just the start. Too. As One Piece goes on, we'll see more characters with impossible, fundamentally cartoony physiology like Gecko Moria and his crew, and Big Mom's extended family, who can't be effectively realized with just a human in a costume, but will also be quite challenging to make work at all in CGI. This show is gonna have to solve a lot of novel problems with every new season, and I have a bad feeling that's going to catch up with it before too long with some fugly, heavily memeable 3D atrocities. But if any Netflix execs or like members of the production crew or whatever are listening right now, I actually have the perfect solution to all of these problems. Yes, I've figured out the secret to making a One Piece adaptation not just good, not just great, but literally perfect. All you need to do is make Tony Tony Chopper a Muppet. And also hire Jim Henson Productions to make the rest of the critters, obviously. Especially Gecko Moria, because he's basically a Nightmare Before Christmas Jabba the Hutt already. Ideal Muppet material. Muppets aren't just the second greatest art form after anime, they're also the ideal medium for creating believable live-action fantasy critters. For starters, you don't have to worry about compositing or getting the material shaders just right, because they're made of real materials already and physically in the same room as the actors. And the fact that there's actual living tissue inside a puppet gives it subtle, natural movements that are hard to fake with a computer. And on top of all that, the obvious, glaring unreality of puppets being puppets actually helps to keep them on the safe side of the uncanny valley while paradoxically encouraging greater suspension of disbelief on the part of the audience. Just think about how much easier it is to believe that Kermit the Frog or Elmo is actually talking to a late night talk show host than any CG character they've tried to do that with. 
CGI fantasy films are still struggling to create inhuman characters with the same presence alongside real actors that the Goblins of Labyrinth had next to David Bowie back in 1986, and we've already seen how hard the Henson team can top that with the aid of subtle CGI and modern animatronics. Well, I've already seen it. A lot of you apparently skipped it, and Netflix cruelly canceled it as a result, but The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance is, without hyperbole, the single best, most immersive work of epic fantasy ever filmed on a physical camera. Yes, better than Lord of the Rings, better than Game of Thrones. I am not joking or trying to start an argument here, I'm just stating what I believe to be a fact. When I watch Age of Resistance with its fully handcrafted world and entirely inhuman yet still clearly physically real cast, I find myself transported in a way that I rarely feel outside of animation, books, and video games. Like I'm not just looking at images on a screen, but peeking through a window into a real, alien world with its own ecosystem full of strange, slightly magical flora and fauna, a place wholly disconnected from this Earth. The same feeling I get reading One Piece, and I just want the live-action version to have that too. Oda's incredible world deserves that premium, better-than-CG treatment. So come on, Netflix. You got the Henson's number already, and frankly, you owe them for failing to put sufficient eyeballs on the first thing you had that could have been a must-watch cultural touchstone prestige fantasy epic to rival Game of Thrones. And heck, if you start talking now, you can probably get a transponder stale or two made in time to film the season one finale. Those guys work fast. I guess I'm still making a lot of assumptions here, though, in thinking that they'll even get a season two. There's a lot of ways the first one could still go wrong. A good plan does not preclude bad execution, and even if they do it right, there's no guarantee that anime fans or audiences in general will actually appreciate it. But if the Straw Hat crew has taught me anything, it's that I should believe in the brightest possibilities and fight with everything I've got to make them real. So, uh, let's try to get hashtag make Tony Tony Chopper a Muppet trending, I guess. If you agree that's a good idea, of course. If you don't, go watch Muppet stuff until you realize how right I am, especially Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. Also, I think Muppet Treasure Island makes a very strong argument for how well their style could synergize with One Piece's world. Also, Definitely watch the Wachowskis Speed Racer if you haven't already. I did over Christmas with some buddies for the first time since I was a kid, and it has instantly become one of my favorite films of all time. It is the rare early 2000s movie where the parts with the kid and the monkey are legitimate comedic highlights. You know, looking back on this whole video, it kind of feels like I'm just using the semi-promising news coming off the One Piece set as an excuse to make Muppet and Speed Racer propaganda, and I'm 100% okay with that. But if you also came away from this feeling moderately more excited about live-action One Piece, that's good too. Unless it's a huge letdown, in which case I'll probably have to skip town for a while. I'm Jeff Thu, Muppet supremacist, signing out from a dusty old theater.